So, yeah, so I think, you know, you, you guys have had, uh, you know, a really good um, Q&A session just now about getting into neurosurgery. You've heard about, you know, the really good work from NANSIC and the BNTRC. And I think it's um, uh, clearly you guys have joined this uh, session today because you are interested in neurosurgery. And I'm hoping I will present to you, you know, the kind of rewarding things of um, becoming a neurosurgeon, um, some of the challenges um, as a trainee and as a consultant uh, of being a neurosurgeon, but hopefully not to put you off. And you, you know, all agree with me that the rewarding side of neurosurgery is worth the pursuit of this career. Um, so we'll start with the, the kind of nice things about neurosurgery, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of uh, neurosurgery um, and show you some um, kind of uh, interesting uh, kind of progression over time, I guess, of um, the kind of technology and things that we have in place and what the future looks like for neurosurgery, which you know um, will definitely be in place by the time you guys you know graduate from medical school and join neurosurgery. Um, I mean, a lot of the things that I do now were not even mentioned when I was a medical student. Um, so I think things are moving on very, very rapidly. Uh, technology is, you know, advancing at a speed that is, you know, um, difficult for some of us to catch up with, probably easier for the younger generation. So I'm sure you all know this already. Uh, the first ever operation done um, in the world um, that is recorded in history is actually a neurosurgical operation. And this is um, documented in the Edwin Smith um, Papyrus. I'm sure you all know about this um, from Egypt. Um, and uh, it is, you know, there may well have been surgical operations before this time, um, but this is the first ever one that's been documented um, dating back to 2600 BC. Um, and this is when they made a hole on someone's skull. Um, and uh, they call it the trephine of the skull, and that was to let out evil spirits, not dissimilar to what we do for chronic subduros, um, and which in a way is an evil spirit, if you like. Um, so we haven't really moved on for the last 5,000 years. We're still doing the same operation, um, uh, just clearly showing it works, um, and people back then actually have very similar um, you know, um, uh, wit uh, to think of these things. Um, and um, shortly after that, uh, the first ever cranioplasty was performed formed in Peru using gold to replace um, one of these um, trephines that was um, made for uh, releasing evil spirit. And actually over the following 1000 years since the first cranioplasty, they then did lots of cranioplasties using seashells, coconut shells, um, uh, cores of various fruits, um, and lots of different metals like nectar and we said gold and silver and bronze. Um, some of them caused major hemorrhage. Some of them caused massive infections because the body was rejecting it. But, you know, you can see neurosurgery has a very, very long history, um, dating back almost 5,000 years, which is quite impressive, really. Um, uh, slightly disconcerting that we're still doing the same operations nowadays. and We haven't really changed some of the practice. Um, but there are, you know, some good changes. Um, so over time, we have jumped quite a few thousand years there, as you can see. Um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. I'm sure you all know Leonardo da Vinci with all his, you know, excellent anatomical drawings. This is one of the first illustrations of the brain and the ventricular system. But slightly different to what we know of the ventricular system nowadays, but. You know, actually, he's got you know, the various ventricles. You know, he's drawn three ventricles, and and you know, in a way, if you count the two lateral ventricles as one, um, then actually we do have three ventricles. The two laterals, a third and a fourth. So it's not actually that inaccurate. Um, it's quite impressive drawings. Um, and then moving on to slightly more recent times, this is um, you know uh, only about um, 300 years ago. Obviously, is the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, um, one of the most important um, kind of fundamental uh, kind of theories in neurosurgery. And I'm sure you all know about this skull being a closed box, and that there are three things in there, which is your brain, your 
blood and your CSF. And if you increase the pressure of one, you have to reduce the pressure of the other. Otherwise, your overall intracranial pressure goes up and it forms a basis of pretty much all of neurosurgery. Um, and then actually, you know, uh, Monroe was um, the mentor to Kelly. Um, they're both from Gl um, Glasgow. Um, and the two of them actually described the skull as a closed box. And that um, the important thing is the blood flowing into the brain and that there is a way for the blood to come out of the brain. Otherwise, the pressure goes up. Um, so that was the original Monroe Kelly doctrine. And then Burroughs, um, almost um, another 50 years down the line, described um, CSF um, because CSF wasn't um, discovered um, back in Monroe's time. Um, so CSF was added, added in by Burroughs and then Cushing as per everything in neurosurgery is always comes back to Harvey Cushing, um, actually coined the term Monroe Kelly doctrine for the first time. Um, so that's where this comes about. I think it's very interesting to hear all the history of neurosurgery. Now, coming back to slightly more recent times again, in quite a few things happened in 1966, not just um, the Football World Cup, um, but also in terms of neurosurgery. Rodell, a very famous um, writer, novelist, obviously, as you know, invented the first ever VP shunt. I don't know if you guys knew this. Um, his son had um, hydrocephalus. Um, Kenneth Till is a neurosurgeon, um, and Rodell went to his friend, um, Kenneth, um, and said, my son's got hydrocephalus. There must be something we can do about this. Um, and Kenneth's like, well, you know, it's a bit of plumbing that we need to do. We need to find a way to get some sort of plumbing system in the patient um, or in his son. So they then went to Stanley Wade, who's um, an engineer. And between the three of them, and mainly from Rodell's kind of imaginative mind and drawing, um, that Stanley Wade made the first ever VP shunt and Kenneth Till placed it into Rodell's son, who then recovered very well from the hydrocephalus. Um, so quite an impressive uh, uh, invention back then. And in the same year, 1966, Walter Dandy um, talked about um, the digital resection of tumors. And this is in the uh, handbook of neuros neurosurgery. This is how it was taught to remove meningiomas, um, you know, sticking your finger around a plane and basically taking the tumor off the brain surface. It even talks about how you use your two fingers to clip any vessels to s prevent it from bleeding. Um, so you can tie them off. Um, uh, this was, you know, practiced for many years um, before, you know, the advent of microscope and, and microsurgical skills and, and dissecting the plane without actually sticking fingers into someone's brain. And obviously, currently, the state of the art, we have endoscopic operations. So this is a picture from an endoscopic cholecyst. Um, so this is an endoscope in the uh, lateral ventricle. You can see the choroid plexus, uh, which is obviously what produces CSF. A beautiful structure, if you ask me. Uh, you've got the septal vein. This is the fornix, uh, which obviously is, governs your short-term memory. And around the fornix is the foramen of Monroe. And this is where CSF normally flows into the third ventricle. And as you can see, there is this extra gray structure, which is the colloid cyst. Um, so, you know, before we used endoscopes, all of these had to be open operations. We did, you know, interhemispheric transcolosal approaches. Um, we still do. There are still a lot of cases where, you know, an endoscopic approach may not be um, appropriate. Um, so it is still an operation that we do relatively frequently, um, but more and more um, likely these are removed um, uh, endoscopically. Um, and then even more um, recently, the advent of the exoscope rather than the microscope. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the exoscope. So the microscope that we've all used obviously has eyepieces that the surgeon look down um, to see what they're doing in a zoomed in uh, manner. The problem with that is, no one else really have the surgeon's view. There's usually a screen on the microscope, but it's a two-dimensional screen. You don't really get a very good view. And, you know, the the, the pixels, the color um, display is just not as good as what the surgeon's actually seeing down the um, microscope. Um, with the exoscope, as you can see, the camera does not have any eyepieces. The camera is just attached to this arm that is over the patient's body. Um, and everybody's watching um, the operation through 3D TV using 3D glasses. Um, and the nice thing about that is every single one in the whole theater has exactly the same view as the surgeon. So it's much easier for people to know exactly what's going on, much easier from a training point of view for the scrub nurses to anticipate what's happening next. Um, and also you can tilt and move the camera without you having to tilt and move with it because you've got eyepieces attached to it. Um, so for the surgeon's own spinal health, it's actually quite good. Um, so the exoscope is quite a nice um, addition to the kit. 
Um, this is a, a brain navigation system. Um, there are lots of different systems. I just have to happen to pick this one. This is a Medtronic Stealth. There is also the um, Brain Lab. Um, uh, there's lots of different uh, versions. Um, this is the latest stealth station that we can use. Essentially, this camera um, recognizes various landmarks on the patient's face and registers it to the scan that you upload onto the system. Um, and then interoperatively, it can use the scan to navigate you and tell you exactly where everything is and increases the accuracy of your operation. This is spinal navigation. So it's very similar to the cranial navigation, uh, except it's used for the spine. Similarly, with the camera looking at um, various landmarks, this is an O1, which is basically an interoperative um, CT scan. Um, you basically put the patient on here, you get them through the OR um, so that it scans you know, the spinal skeleton, and you use that scan to register the patient and do your operation. And then robot. Um, this is the Neuromate robot. Um, uh, it was first used in Bristol um, for the brain stimulators. So rather than um, the old fashioned ways where you put a frame on the patient's head, you then send them down for a repeat scan whilst they're under an anesthetic with a frame on. And then you have to work out, you know, all the different coordinates. You have to physically mark where your, um, you know, your target point is for your stimulator. And then you come back to theatre, you then put in test electrodes. You have a neurologist there to test the patient's symptoms. Um, and then you have to work out whether you're in the right place, you're not in the right place. And then you replace it with a real the stimulator, you can imagine that whole thing takes a long time. So with, with the robot, essentially, you upload a scan to the robot, the robot's arm will move to exactly the place that will get your electrode to exactly the right spot that you've marked on the scan preoperatively. Um, so it's much more accurate, it cuts out all the faffing around and you can get this operation done, you know, much quicker. Um, the next step, which is already available um, in Bristol as a kind of more proto prototype, I guess, is uh, object um, avoidance um, software. Um, so you don't even have to find whatever subnucleus it is that you're trying to target for your deep brain stimulator. You just tell the computer, I want the ZN nucleus of the thalamus or whatever it is. The computer will automatically find that, work out where all the eloquent parts of the brain and other blood vessels are, and give you the perfect trajectory to avoid hitting anything important. And you know, all you have to do is to stick the electrode down the robot arm and it will automatically be in the right place. Um, so that obviously is the next step for that to be more widely used. I know Queen Square near um, recently bought one of these robots just a few months ago. Um, so they're starting some robotic uh, functional neurosurgery as well. In terms of moving forward from that point, um, well, shunts is an interesting thing, and I put it in there. This is not a filter shunt. This is a shunt that we already use, and it's already come a long way. Um, you know, when VP shunt was first um, invented, as you saw earlier on, it's essentially just a tube. Um, it does have a little valve in there to try and slow down the flow of the fluid so that the gravity doesn't pull everything down. But essentially, it's just a tube. And then over time, we've got lots of different types of valves that opens at different um, kind of pressure settings. And then we have the flow control valves, and then in the last kind of 15, 20 years, we have the programmable valves. Um, and then over time, these programmable valves are now MRI compatible. Um, and we now have not only a programmable pressure valve, we also have a programmable gravitational unit. And then more recently, Recently, we've got these sensor reservoirs, which allows you to measure patient's ICP using this magnet, so you don't have to stick monitors into the patient's brain. Um, and you know, this is you can see only in the last you know 50 years, um, we've gone from a tube to pretty much you know, very um, kind of science fiction like um, valves um, and sensors. Um, and you can only imagine what you know the future holds as we continue to develop in this space. From a brain tumor point of view, we now use um, tractography. So when you, um, you're doing your navigation scan, for example, and you've highlighted where the tumor is, you can use the computer to calculate where are the important tracks. So here you've got the cortical spinal tract highlighted so that interoperatively you know where you are and that you need to avoid these white matter tracks because that's what's going to cause potential disability to the patient. Um, so you know, this DTI has been around for a while, um, but using DTI um, for surgery is really only become, you know, uh, in favor in the last 
I'd say 10 years at the most. Um, and it's really only become common practice in the last you know, three or four years. Uh, and once again, you know, there's, there's a lot of scope to improve on this. You know, currently all of these DTIs are based on human made algorithms. So the tracks that are showing are only as accurate as the algorithm that's been written by a computer genius. Um, you know, there are certainly lots of improvement that can be made in the algorithm to make these even better. Robotic spine surgery, um, once again, that is relatively new concept. There's a handful of units across the world that does it, um, but we're really talking about quite a small number of units that's currently using these, and they're still a little bit clunky, uh, so a lot of room for improvement. But just like the robot I was telling you about for the deep brain stimulator, essentially this is a robot whereby you've marked out all your screws trajectories before the surgery, and the robot will automatically move to the right place so that your screw can only go in one direction to a particular depth. Um, and so you know that screw is going exactly where where you've marked it on the scan preoperatively. And so using the robot to make sure that your screws are you know, very well placed and they're not going to breach anything and cause injury to spinal cord or vertebral artery in the cervical spine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these things, like I said, they are fancy gadgets. If you speak to people who are senior to me, they'll be like, well, I've been doing freehand, you know, screws for the last 25 years. What's the problem? You know, my patient's not been paralyzed by my screws or anything, um, which is all fine. Uh, and it's fair enough to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, if this is going to improve patient safety, then surely it's the right thing to do. Um, and I'm sure medical legally as well, at some point, you know, in the future, probably when you guys become consultants, uh, if you put a screw in the wrong place and you did it without a robot, you will probably get pulled up in court to say, well, the technology is available to make sure you don't do exactly what you've done. So why did you not use the robot? Um, so this is all to come in your lifetime, really. Um, this is a surgical theater, um, which is basically, as you can see, um, using virtual reality um, to simulate an operation. So this is excellent for training, but also for preoperative planning. And this is brand new on the market. Um, I'm not even sure if any unit in the UK actually has one yet. Um, they've been showcasing it at our SBNS meetings, but I'm not sure if anyone's actually bought one to use. Um, but essentially, you it's like a navigation system. You upload the scan beforehand, um, and then you connect it up to your Oculus so that you're now seeing this 3D model in um, you know, in, in, in virtual world. Um, and then you can drill away the bone, you can look at the brain, you can dissect through the sylvan fissure, um, or you can look from inside the skull back to the outside um, and drill from the inside back to the outside so you know where you need to turn the skull to get to the right place. And all the simulation that you do potentially can be loaded onto your actual navigation machine and then that's superimposed onto the patient so that interoperatively you can drill exactly what you simulated the day before and not a centimeter more and not a centimeter less. So you know exactly where you are and you know exactly when you're going to see the first branch of this blood vessel or, or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, very exciting um, virtual reality application and augmented reality application um, coming our way. All this technology is already available, obviously, uh, and certainly in the gaming world, you know, it's been available for many years. We are just very slow at adapting things to the medical world. Um, but, you know, it's certainly improved training and improved surface provision, I think. So that's all the kind of exciting progression in neurosurgery and all the things to look forward to, you know, as you guys become neurosurgical trainees and, and during your career life. Um, the next section of the talk is um, the bad of neurosurgery. It's not really bad. It's the, I'm basically going to show you a whole load of really what I feel are badass cases that will make you feel you want to do neurosurgery. So starting with something very simple, um, elderly gentleman fell off a ladder, um, came in with a GCS score of um, 8 out of 15, fixed dilated pupil on the right hand side, and you've got this um, CT scan. Um, uh, if you've been in A&E research, I'm sure you've been to trauma calls, and trauma calls can be quite exciting depending on what's coming in, um, and you've got quite a lot of people working on the same patient, and the nice thing about trauma, I find, is often you have polytrauma, so you know, most patients injure more than one system, you know, falling off a ladder. You know, I've shown you the acute subdural. What I haven't shown you is that he's also got pelvic fracture um, and he's also got an ankle fracture. So, so there are often several systems that are injured and this now requires 
multiple specialties working together to do the best for this patient. And I'm talking about from A&E to anesthesia, to orthopedics, general surgery, vascular surgery, plastic surgery, potentially maxillofacial surgery, um, you know, and obviously neurosurgery. Um, and, you know, not just in terms of I'm going to operate on this bit, you're going to operate on that bit, et cetera, but also making the decision as to, you know, is it actually appropriate to do anything at all in the first place? Um, and secondly, in what order should we be doing these things? Now, in this case, it's pretty obvious. There's a really large blood clot, a subdural hematoma, causing a lot of midline shift. This patient needs an operation. So you go straight for theatre and open up the head. Um, this is after the craniotomy. We've opened up the leaves of the dura. You can see the big solid blood clot in there. This is part of the reason why acute subdurals cannot be done through burr holes because it's a very large solid clot that won't come out through a little hole. And this is what it looks like once the clot comes out. You've got a slightly sunken in brain because of the pressure that's been on the brain. If it was a younger person, you would expect this brain to start expanding and possibly herniating through the craniotomy defect because it was under so much pressure. In an older gentleman, obviously, the brain is a little bit atrophic, so you've got a bit of a gap, but essentially a normal-looking brain. So this, in this case, is obvious. This is the priority. You have to do this first. Um, but, you know, I've had cases where patient comes in as what we call code red trauma, so they are they've got major hemorrhage um, from somewhere in the abdomen or in the chest um, to the extent that there is actually no time to go down to CT. So a patient coming to research, a quick primary survey, and then, you know, within 15 minutes, you are in the operating theater. You've got the cardiothoracics and general surgeons cracking open the chest and opening up the abdomen, trying to find a bleeding point, taking out the spleen, you know, um, opening up the heart to stitch up, um, well, I say heart, the pericardium to, to stitch up whatever laceration there is, the ventricles, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, this patient has fixed dilated pupil. So, you know, your, your, your decision now is, you know, do I wait for a CT scan? Because we haven't got a CT scan. We've gone straight to theater. Or do I wait for these people to finish operating? The priority clearly was the major hemorrhage. But in a way, there is no point stopping the hemorrhage if the patient's going to cone and die from the brain. Um, so, you know, that sometimes it can be difficult decisions. And, not, and, you know, the whole point of having the whole team there is you can talk to all of them and say, look, I don't think we can wait the one, one and a half hours, whatever it is, for you guys to complete your operation and then go downstairs for the CT scan of the brain. You know, he's got fixed dilated people on the right hand side. I'm just going to open up the right side and see what I find. Um, and maybe that's the right thing to do. But, you know, it's really exciting, um, you know, um, fast decision making under quite stressful um, scenarios. And if you're if that's the kind of thing that you like, then, you know, neurosurgery, especially neurotrauma is definitely the right thing for you. This is a very typical case. Um, once again, this is a young man, bilateral leg pains, complaining of a bit of numbness in the private areas and hasn't really weed for the last few hours. Um, you know, very typical history of a corda equina syndrome and very typical scan showing a corda equina syndrome. Big disc prolapse at the L45 level, compressing the whole corda equina here on the axial. Normally you see CSF, which is white on this T2 sequence and you don't see any of that. Um, so there's a very typical corda equina. Um, uh, syndrome yeah, ideally goes straight to theater. I mean, it's hard to know what is the perfect timing for called Aquinas syndrome, but you know, the way I see neurosurgery is that you know, what would I want if I was the person with this problem? You know, if I went into hospital and I'm wetting myself because I've got big disc, I want my surgery now. I don't care that the literature says that you know, the outcome is no difference whether I have surgery now or at 48 hours, I don't want to wait 48 hours. I want my surgery now. And I think the patients should be allowed to have exactly that. Um, so I get these patients to theatre as soon as I can. Um, you know, within reason, there's no point starting an operation at three o'clock in the morning, obviously, when you're really tired. But certainly by eight o'clock in the morning, it should be started. Uh, a bit more exciting. This is a patient who presented uh, with cough headaches, a young girl who presented with headaches every time she coughed, she laughed, she leant forward, and then she started developing pins and needles, um, kind of in her hands and in her feet. And what you're seeing here, as you can tell, there's something wrong with the spinal cord in the, in the cervical spine. There's a very large syrinx, a syringal myelia, which is basically a fluid collection within the spinal cord. And if you follow this up, what you can see is that this part of the cerebellum it's what we call the cerebellar tonsils. It's actually below the level of the former magnum. If you imagine a line from the tip of the clivus to the tip of the suboccipital bone, that's the former magnum. That's the base of the skull. This has descended through. So this is a patient with a Chiari malformation causing obstruction of CSF flow and therefore syringomyelia. 
So what do we do for these? We open them up. Um, oops, I've got them not quite in the right order, um, but we open up um, uh, the, 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 the head um, at the back. We take a little bit of bone off. What I personally normally do is I do an ultrasound scan, as you see here. This is the tonsil that's pulsating within the dura, which is this thick white line here. Um, so what you're trying to look for once you've done your bone decompression is, have I created enough space so that CSF can get past, which means we'll restore normal CSF flow and we won't worry about the syrinx. Now the tonsil's pulsating, but there's not much CSF around there. So for this particular case, we decided to open the dura. And as you can see, this is what we've got. We've got a cerebellar tonsil up here. And here, after I've retracted it up, this is actually the brain stem becoming the spinal cord. And um, there's a large, very kind of thickened um, arachnoid um, um, kind of membrane, which is causing a bit of a locule and it's blocking CSF flow. And if you go back to the original MRI scan, you can see that white thing here between the brain stem and the cerebellar tonsil. That's exactly what we were looking at. So under the microscope, we open this with a sharp hook um, and then peel it off with sharp scissors and things off the brainstem and off the cerebellar tonsils. And this is the post-op scan. You can see we've taken some bone off. The cerebellar tonsil is no longer compressed. That's good flow of CSF and the syrinx completely resolved. Um, yeah, this, yeah, if you don't think this looks beautiful, then you're in the wrong specialty. <laughs> this is as good as it gets. <laughs> More trauma, there's a guy who stabbed himself with a screwdriver, as you can see, um, literally just picked up a screwdriver and, and shoved it into his own temple area. In the old days, we used to turn a big craniotomy around the um, screwdriver. We then get brain retractors in there, move the brain out of the way very carefully so we don't damage the um, brain as the screwdriver comes out. Um, but learning from our South African um, colleagues who clearly sees a lot more penetrating injury than we do, what we now do is uh, we literally just unscrew and pull, as you see in this picture. And then what we do is we then run an angio on the patient and make sure that there is no contrast leaking from any of the blood vessels. And if there is, we'll embolize the vessel to stop the bleeding. Um, but this avoids the patient having a really big operation just to remove a bit of foreign body. Works extremely well. But this is some advance in, I guess, in the way we operate rather than advance in the technology. Another case for you, sudden onset headache. I'm sure you all know this very well, subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, this uh, very typical history where they are completely fine and then within a split second, 10 out of 10 headache, like they are uh, hit around the back of the head. Um, pretty much every patient who comes into hospital with a subarachnoid hemorrhage will give you exactly the same history, assuming they are obviously awake and alert. Um, and if you look at the CT scan, you can see blood, which is white on the CT scan in the what we call the basal cisterns. So these are the um, CSF spaces at the base of the brain going up into the interhemispheric fissure and into both sylvian fissures, more on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side. And this points to a potential aneurysm on the right-hand side because you've got more blood on that side. You run a CT angiogram and you can see this aneurysm on the right middle cerebral artery. It's the internal carotid artery here. I'm just pointing out the anatomy. Um, and then it trifurcates into your anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and the posterior communicating artery that joins onto the posterior cerebral artery, which as you know, comes off the basilar artery. So this is a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Um, these can be obviously coiled by um, our radiology colleagues. And I would say probably 90 to 95% of aneurysms are now coiled by radiologists, uh, which some people will say it's a good thing for the patients because they're not having open surgery. Um, from a training point of view, it means that you guys are missing out on a lot of really nice microsurgical operations. Um, yeah, you, you can see it in either way, um, to be honest. Uh, but if you can't coil it for whatever reason, then you can do an open operation, split the sylvian fissure, find the middle cerebral artery, find where the aneurysm is coming off the artery. So this is what we call the neck of the um, aneurysm. And then we put a clip across the neck of the aneurysm so that the blood can't get into it. A very delicate operation, but a very rewarding and nice operation, assuming it goes well. A uh, very difficult operation, especially in an acute setting because the blood vessels are a bit more friable, the aneurysm is quite friable, and the brain itself is quite swollen, which means it's that much harder to get adequate exposure to see what you want to see. But lovely operations. This is one of the few things that most of us do fear, which is a very young patient sudden collapse 
come in with massive hydrocephalus. Um, and the reason we fear is not because we don't know how to stick a drain into the brain to drain the CSF, but because you know, there is very few cases where you can truly say time is brain. And when you get obstructive hydrocephalus, acute obstructive hydrocephalus, and actually literally every minute counts. Um, you know, even in trauma and a big hematoma, of course, the quicker you get the clot out, the better. But even then, there is some gif that's, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, you miss the boat just by delaying it by five minutes. Um, this particular patient came in to a &E with a terrible headache. Um, she says 15 out of 15. I went to see her in a &E. This explained to her that she's got this hydrocephalus. We have to get her straight to theater for bilateral external ventricular drains. And then once she recovers, obviously talk about resecting this cyst. Um, and she consented to all of this. Um, I turned around, said to the nurses that, um, you know, can we get her wristband sorted out? Can we get her checklist sorted out? Because we're sending for her straight away. That takes me, what, 20 seconds to say? Less than that? I turned back around. She had fixed dilated pupils bilaterally. They dropped that quickly. And that's why we always worry when it's a acute a, um, obstructive hydrocephalus. Anyway, she had bilateral EVDs, did extremely well. And then we did an endoscopic operation where we went in. Um, this is the lateral ventricle. If you remember from the previous view, choroid plexus, septal vein. There's a big cholysis just sitting here. Um, this one is after we cut into the cholysis, and this white stuff is a bit of very thick gelatinous substance, which is the colloid coming out of the cyst. We are essentially removing as much of it as possible, sucking it out of the cyst, as you can see, a string of it being sucked into the endoscope. And once we clear everything, we then manage to get ourselves into the third ventricle. So this is a view from within the third ventricle. These are the mammillary bodies, which essentially is just at the top of your brainstem. Um, your basilar artery will be sitting just here. You can just about see a view of the basilar artery. Your pituitary gland is somewhere out here. If you were to do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, this is the place to make your hole. Um, but uh, you know the fact that we managed to get into third ventricle, given there's a big cyst, tells you that everything's re-established and the job is done. Um, but you know you have to be quite lucky if you present in such an acute way to get to this stage, because um, a lot of them actually don't make it that far um, to that stage. So it's quite worrying. Moving on a little bit, oncology cases. This is a very large brain tumor, as you can see. It's very heterogeneous in terms of the contrast enhancement. It's very irregular in terms of the shape of it. So this is very typical of a high-grade or malignant glioma. This is a grade four glioblastoma. Uh, it's in the dominant hemisphere. It's around the language area. So, you know, this is a very difficult um, operation um, because ultimately what you're trying to do for these brain tumors is debulk as much of it as possible so that the patient can have adjuvant radiotherapy and chemotherapy. But if you cause a disability and the performance status therefore drops, they will no longer be eligible for adjuvant therapy. And if they're not having adjuvant therapy, then you haven't actually changed their prognosis. So all you've done is converted someone who's going to live three months to someone who's going to live three months with a disability. Um, so the surgery has to be very delicate. You have to be very careful. Um, this is an operating theater, um, actually in Bristol Children's Hospital where I trained, um, just to show you how some of the setup just happened to have a nice photo of it. You know, obviously patients on the operating table, you've got the navigation machine that I mentioned earlier on um, to make sure you know we are very accurate with what we're doing. Through those double doors is the intraoperative MRI scan. So you'll be doing your operation, debulking the surgery. You can do this as an awake operation. If you have a speech and language therapist there to test the speech to make sure you're within the margins of the Humor. When you think you've done you know, a good enough job, you can then push the patient through these doors, get an MRI scan, see how much tumor is left and whether it's possible to come back and take out more or whether you've done enough and you're ready to close. So this is a, you know, the, the kind of setup you want for good oncology um, center. Um, and this is just an interoperative photo of 5-ALA or um, um, glyolan, uh, which basically is um, a drink that you give the patient. Um, um, preoperatively or down an NG tube, and then under fluorescent light, the tumor, so the malignant cells, will highlight as pink. Normal brain tissue doesn't. So it's a nice way to see where there is still remaining tumor uh, and what else might need to come out. So lots of different things that we do to try and make the surgery as safe as possible, but also maximal resection um, without damaging the patient. 
other interesting cases. This is a case that I did when I went to Vietnam on a charity trip. This is a child born, as you can see, with some congenital defects. Essentially, she was born without um, the bony skull base, and therefore the brain, which was developing and expanding, has descended down to the nose. And as a result of the brain basically expanding during development in the nose, it's pushed the eye sockets apart. So the facial skeleton is wide and she's got terrible hypertellarism um, and lack of a nose. Um, and as you can see on the CT scan um, down here, this bit where my cursor is, this should be where the nose is and where should, you should see the cribriform plate of the skull bone. Um, but instead you're seeing brain all the way down there. Um, so we had to do an operation to essentially reduce this encephalocele, so bring this bit of brain back up, find a bit of bone somewhere from the rest of the skull to replace the skull base so that the brain is kept above the skull base and not descending down there. And then we had to essentially medialize both of her orbits to try and create a slightly norm, more normal kind of facies, um, mainly to improve her vision, to be honest, rather than for cosmetic reasons. Another interesting kind of skull-related case is this um, head injury. This is a patient who fell over um, and basically a pole, as you can see, has penetrated through his skull, um, his frontal bone, his orbit. It's actually gone in just above the globe of the right eye. Um, so luckily it's missed his eye and his vision is still intact. But as you can see, the, the, the frontal bone, the frontal sinus, the orbit is completely smashed up. Um, and this is one where you would do a joint operation with the maxillofacial team. Um, you have to expose all of the orbit. Um, they will help you plate around the nasal bones, you know, along the zygoma if necessary, um, zygomatic process, zygoma, sometimes the maxilla or even the floor of the orbit if necessary. Um, and then obviously we can put the rest back together ourselves. So nice joint cases. And then I put this down as my last cuff um, nice case to show you because I think this really shows what difference we can make to a patient. Um, this is a patient with normal pressure hydrocephalus um, and as you can see really struggled to even stand up uh, despite help from one of my previous mentors Mr Richard Edwards um, one of the neurosurgeons in um, Bristol and you can see really poor balance struggling to take a first step falling backwards so we then put a shunt into him and this is him three months after shunting. You know, really quite excellent results um, just from a simple shunt operation. And I'm sure you've seen similar videos of Parkinson's patients or movement disorder patients having their brain stimulators and the tremor completely stopping. Um, so you really can make some quite good changes to patients' quality of life. And that's the main focus in neurosurgery. It's not just about prolonging life, it's prolonging meaningful life and quality of life. And, um, and I guess that's the interesting thing for me is the interesting thing of neurosurgery in that what I think is quality of life may not be what you think is quality of life. We all interpret it slightly differently. Um, and, you know, we've had patients with really quite terrible brain injuries come in that we think they may survive it if we do absolutely everything for them, but they probably will be in a wheelchair for the rest of their life. They probably need 24 hour nursing care to be fed, possibly fed through a PEC tube, you know, breathing through a tracheostomy tube because they're paralyzed from, uh, from also a cervical spine injury or something along those lines. And to me, that is not a quality of life and I would rather not live like that. But then there are patients who are very grateful for you saving their lives so that they can live like that because They've got a very young family and they are just grateful to be there to see the children grow up and go to school and and or, or be able to at least be pushed down the aisle to attend you know the wedding um, you know that's everyone's in a slightly different part of their life um, and therefore we all want something slightly different and so I, I find that to be the most interesting part of neurosurgery is how do you judge what is good quality of life for the person in front of you and therefore how would you adjust your decision making for the person in front of you um, I don't know how many of you read my Twitter feeds in the morning. Um, I do this morning paper Twitter feed every morning and and it was this morning that we talked about how um, you know evidence-based medicine is good to a certain extent but it is looking at a general population and you can't always apply it to every single individual patient that you see in front of you because they are not a general 
population person. They're not just the average Joe Blocks off the street. You know, everyone is slightly different in a particular way, and you have to bring those factors into, you know, play when you're making decisions. Um, and that is by far the hardest bit of neurosurgery. And that is going to be the next part of my talk, which is the ugly side of neurosurgery. Um, you know, I've shown you some cases that's gone extremely well, patients done really well, despite some very complicated pathology, difficult operations, etc. But it clearly isn't always the case. And, you know, I think I, I would be lying to you if I only show you those cases and make it look like neurosurgery. It's this amazing specialty where you literally come and save lives every single day. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. And, you know, you have to be prepared for some cases that don't go well. So the first case is this young man who opened the door um, when someone rang the doorbell. Um, and as he opened the door, someone literally just shoved a gun into his mouth and shot him um, through his pharynx. And you can see the bullet's gone through the C2 um, peg, through the spinal cord, through the posterior elements, and then lodged at the back. He came in obviously completely quadriplegic. Um, he also um, had to be intubated because he was apneic. As you can imagine, he's taken out um, his spinal cord and therefore he's lost um, his phrenic nerve and his diaphragm doesn't move. So he was apneic and had to be intubated. Now, you would quite like to think that he's a young man, you know, we should go in there, take out the bullets, give everything a good wash, maybe even fix his spine. Um, okay, he may not recover his function, but he's only 17 years old. You know, he potentially could be in a wheelchair, as I mentioned earlier on. He could be, you know, watching TV. He could, you know, you can have um, voice commands for computers. So he can potentially still do things at this young age. Um, but what uh, actually happened is that because of the gunshot through the vertebrae, it actually has also gone through the vertebral artery. And he actually then developed quite a massive infarct of the brainstem. Um, and uh, he never managed to um, cough or start breathing on his own. He was completely reliant on the ventilator. Every time you try to come down on the ventilator settings, um, he just become more hypoxic because he wasn't triggering um, at all. He wasn't breathing for himself. So you've now got this situation where you've got a 17-year-old who's quadriplegic for the rest of his life, who's never going to come off the ventilator for the rest of his life, um, but has a heart that is still ticking. What do you do? You know, um, and I don't know if you've watched the news. Uh, that it's been in the media recently. Royal London Hospital had a you know child, essentially very similar story, not a gunshot, but you know has a heart that ticks. Um, and that particular child actually still breathes for himself. Um, but apart from that, absolutely nothing. That child wasn't even waking up. You know, what, how do you decide? This is the moment to say too much is too much, and we should just switch off the ventilator. Um, it's a very difficult decision um, and obviously involves the whole family. Um, the decision ultimately rests on the responsible clinician, which means the surgeon, a consulting surgeon who looks after this patient. Um, they make the final call. So you can go against the family, but no one likes going against family. It creates a lot of sour taste in your mouth. And, and you, you, know, you want to work with the family, not against the family. Um, and it could take several weeks of many discussions to work out you know, what actually is in the best interest of this young man. Um, so very difficult. <laughs> this is another case when I was out in Vietnam. It's a baby who was born uh, with, obviously, as you can see, uh, a, a deformity to the skull. He's actually got APET syndrome, which is quite a rare genetic disorder, um, a problem with the um, fibroblast um, growth factor. Um, and what you can see here, um, if I show you the x-ray first, if you look at a skull x-ray, can you see lots of imprints, almost look like bowel gas if, you, if this was an abdominal x-ray. These are basically imprints of the gyri of the brain on the skull, on the inside of the skull, and it's called a copper beaten skull. And it basically means that the intracranial pressure is so high that the brain is actually eroding into the um, skull itself. And you can almost see the shape of the brain when you just look at a child. And when I ran my finger on his head, I could feel every single gyrus. I can tell you where the motor strip is just by feeling his head. Um, and when you look at the scan, you know, he's got uh, you know, quite significant hydrocephalus for someone this age group. Um, and you can see how the brain is eroding into the um, skull. And, you know, the question is, uh, what do you do? Uh, it's a really tricky um, um, position where, yes, we can put a shunt in that will get rid of the hydrocephalus um, and reduce the intracranial pressure. 
you then probably have to do some form of calvarium reconstruction to expand the skull for him because all his suture lines are fused too early. So the skull will no longer expand with the brain and that's where the problem is. So you then have to pretty much open up the whole head, remove all of the bone, you know, front to parato temporal everything and expand it physically for the baby so you give space for the brain to expand and yes all of this is doable but what do you actually achieve at the end you know do we actually think by doing that the brain will continue to develop and that this baby will catch up in terms of his milestones and development um, or do we think actually he will remain exactly as he is um, essentially unconscious not really doing anything and then you have to think well is there a point in doing it? And once again, extremely difficult decision um, to be had with the parents. This is a young girl who was crossing the road and a um, blue light police car hit her at very high speed. Um, and she had a traumatic um, respiratory arrest at the scene. Um, but managed at ROSC um, after a few cycles of CPR intubator and brought into A&E. And the obvious abnormality here, if you haven't spotted it so far, is the gap between the skull and the neck. So she has dislocated her head from the rest of her spine. Um, and you know this is unfortunately an unsurvivable injury because not only have you dislocated the neck and therefore put traction on the spinal cord, you've also put traction on both your carotid arteries and both your vertebral arteries, and they'll be dissected. And when we did a CT angiogram, actually you'll see contrast coming up to about the C2 level, and it didn't go any further. So you know there was no blood flow to the brain. So in a way, this was a slightly easier decision that you know, there is actually no hope um, then there was no point to um, carry on forward. But I think, you know, if it doesn't sadden you even just slightly to say this 22 year old is going to die and we're going to pull out, um, then, you know, there is something wrong with you. You know, we, we all feel sad when these cases happen, unfortunately, and there is nothing you can do. This is a road traffic accident patient um, with lots of facial fractures um, and the paramedics at the scene couldn't intubate the patient as a result and decided to go for a nasopharyngeal airway which as you can see obviously has gone the wrong way and this is very important to show you that things can go wrong you know anything in medicine can go wrong surgery can go wrong and what sounds like a simple thing putting in their way can also go wrong um, and this patient died um, presumably of the original brain injury rather than the nasopharyngeal airway but if you're the person who put this airway in um, you know for many many years to come you will feel that there is something yeah that you could have potentially done differently done better you know was this death related to something i've done uh, and once again if this doesn't make you feel slightly upsetting um uh, you, you need to have a think about you know am i actually a serial killer by nature um, so you know things can go wrong and you have to live with the potential complications and consequences of your complications this is a young girl who jumped tombstoning i don't know if you guys know what tombstoning is you might know that in southampton um it's something that i, I think is probably unique to the west country to be honest um it's when people jump from high height into shallow water something we don't see in london because we don't have shallow water um, uh, but essentially they jump from high height into shallow water and they either um, end up having a severe brain injury or they dislocate the neck as you can see um and you know Obviously, the initial management is very obvious. You need to perfuse the spinal cord, you need to reduce the dislocation, and you need to fix the, the spine. Um, but that's pretty much all you can do. Whether the spinal cord will recover any function or not, is really out of your hands. There isn't really much you can do to change the nature of the repair process within the spinal cord, or at least with the current medical technology. There isn't really a way to affect that. So, you know, you can do everything you can, um, but if she's never going to recover her function, um, once again, that's very sad and that's not something we can do anything about. So we do get, you know, bad outcome cases, sometimes as a direct result of things we've done to a patient, sometimes as a result of the original pathology that you can't really reverse. Um, and once again, you know, this I think this happens more in neurosurgery than other surgical disciplines. Um, it happens in every branch of medicine to be honest but i do think there is a higher percentage of neurosurgery conditions that are irreversible compared to other um, disciplines and once again despite all the 
you know, really exciting cases I've shown you, or the very um, elegant microsurgical skills that you may have seen with other surgeons, um, and all the success stories that you hear about. There are also these really sad cases um, that you will see lots of during your career life, and you'll have to learn to live with. This is another one of those, a young girl hit by a car at high speed. And what you're seeing here is a complete lack of um, structure of the brain. You don't see any sulci, you don't see the white matter or the gray matter. So this is basically when you've got a terrible hypoxic brain injury and the whole brain is just ischemic. You've lost all the CSF around the brainstem, you've lost the CSF around the foramen magnum because the patient has already coned. So, you know, this is one of those cases where you are like, well, I think the brain isn't really going to survive. Um, I think this girl is going to die. But then she's only 19 years old and the parents crying behind you saying, please just try everything. I want you to try absolutely everything. And in your mind, you're thinking, I don't think we should because I don't think it's going to make a difference. But at the same time, um, she's 19. Um, can you really give up on the 19 year old? Um, what are you going to say to the parents? Because, you know, part of this is also if you don't do anything, and obviously the patient will die, um, the parents will always feel that you didn't try your best. And also they will feel that they've not pushed hard enough for you to try your best. And they will also live the rest of their life with some guilt that they didn't do enough to to, to potentially give her a better chance of survival. Although the medical profession may feel that the surgery is futile and does not actually improve her chance of survival. So you've got this difficult um, kind of dilemma, you know, what do you do? And, you know, if you do end up doing a decompression, which we did in this case, you potentially have something like this, which is essentially the brain starts to herniate beyond the level of the craniectomy um, interoperatively so whilst we were you know as soon as we opened the dura in this case the brain just came out like toothpaste and we couldn't get the skin back together because the brain was beyond the level of the scalp we couldn't actually close the wound so we then actually had to physically cut out her frontal lobes just to create enough space to close the wound and then we got this immediate post-op scan and despite both frontal lobes being removed you can see the rest of the brain has started herniating through already so, you know, exactly as we feared, um, the surgery just makes things worse. Um, and the last thing you need is for someone to die on table. What you want is for them to die in a side room quietly with the family around them holding their hands. Um, so this is, you know, terrible outcome. And, you know, was it a really bad decision? Retrospectively, you know, I'd say, yes, it probably was a bad decision to decompress her. Um, but if we didn't decompress her, We've now probably be standing in court with the family and the family will probably be having nightmares every night thinking they didn't try hard enough either. So in a way, the family now walks away feeling they have tried everything. She's been given every possible chance. They're very thankful to you. And they will also have a peace of mind that, you know, they have tried the best. So maybe it was the better thing for those who remain living. Who knows? Very philosophical decision there. Um, Anyway, I shall end my talk with a quick summary. I think neurosurgery is excellent, and I would say that because I'm biased, but I think it's excellent because the cases are very exciting. There's a lot of room for improvement, a lot of things that we haven't discovered yet, a lot of um, chances to work with our engineers to make the best out of the technology that are upcoming, um, to make a real difference to patient safety, to training um, of our next generation, um, and just improve things overall. The challenges are the difficult decisions that you've seen, the complications that you can't avoid. And as you may have already heard, difficulty in terms of actually getting into the specialty in the first place. Um, and even if you're in the specialty training, the bottleneck at the end of registrar training to get a consultant job is not often the easiest thing um, to achieve. So there are you know, lots of challenges, but you know, I, and, and I think this works for every specialty that you may decide to go for is that you have to have passion for what you do. And I think if you truly love what you do and you truly love your patients that you look after, you wouldn't mind these challenges because you'll just go the extra mile to make sure you achieve what you want. And um, I sound like a really old man trying to speak to, you know, <laughs> you guys, but uh, that is truly what I believe. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. Any questions? Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help explain the mysteries of the brain.